Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for using class data to provide effective feedback. This is the final installment of our 2013 webinar series, The Class System, Practical Strategies for Improving Learning. You can watch all previous webinars in the series at teachstone.com. Click the class tool, then click webinar series on the left sidebar. We'll be announcing our 2014 series very soon, so be sure to check back for our future offerings. During our time together today, our presenter, Hilary Ritt, will teach us about class data collection models and recommendations for aligning your goals and strategies with feedback you provide to teachers, care providers, program level administrators, and center directors. My name is Keely Breeden, and I'll be your moderator. And before we get started, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar will run for about an hour, and we'll have an opportunity for question and answer at the end of today's session. But if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A box to chat with us. We'll also be tweeting during the webinar using the hashtag ClassData. You can join the conversation using Twitter, the Twitter feature in the webinar. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website as a free resource. Once the recording is posted on our website, we'll send a link to everyone who registered for the webinar, letting them know that it's ready to view. And finally, at the end of our time today, we ask that you take a few minutes to complete our brief five-question event survey. Your answers will help us to imp improve future events. You can find the survey in the webinar console at the bottom of your screen by clicking the red survey button on the right. Next, I'd like to give you all a bit of background information about TeachStone. TeachStone provides educators with the knowledge, tools, and skills proven to improve student learning and development by focusing on the effectiveness of teacher-child interactions. TeachStone works at the intersection of research and practice, enabling teachers to maximize the impacts of their moment-to-moment -moment interactions with students. Our evidence-based offerings range across the age levels from birth through grade 12, and they empower educators to learn about, measure, and improve teacher-student interactions. Since interactions are at the core of what we do, we hope you'll continue to interact with us following today's presentation. As I mentioned, today is the last in our 2013 webinar series. We're very excited about our offerings for 2014, and we'll post the new webinar schedule before the end of the year. You can get more information and register for our future events by visiting our website at teachstone.com. Also keep in mind that we post all of our webinar recordings online as a free resource. We hope you'll stay in touch with us by following us on Facebook and Twitter, and remember, we'll be live tweeting during today's presentation with the hashtag ClassData. Finally, you can always connect with us by calling our customer support number, which is 1-866-998-8352. Now, before I hand it over to Hillary, we have two quick poll questions for you. First, we want to know a bit, of, a bit about you, so tell us your role in education. Please choose the option that's closest to what you do for the majority of your day. We want to make sure that the information we provide to you today suits your needs. Once we know a bit more about you, we can tailor our later discussion accordingly. We've had a wide range of folks join these webinars in the past, so it's always interesting to see who's on the line. And we'll be closing the poll in just a few seconds if you want to go ahead and put in your answer. Great. It looks like we have a good majority of coaches and technical assistance providers on the web today, and we also have a few education manager managers and a few program directors, and a few of everything else. So that's great. Thank you very much. And our next question for you is, what is your knowledge of the class measure and related resources? Do you know just a little bit about the class? Have you used it on occasion, but perhaps aren't an expert yet? Or do you use the class frequently and feel comfortable with the associated language? We know that the class knowledge varies among participants <coughs> on these webinars, and we want to be sure to cater to your depth of understanding today. All right, I will close the poll in just a couple seconds if you want to go ahead and put in your answers now.
Great. It looks like it looks like almost half of you have a very good understanding of the class lens and language and a sprinkling of other experiences. So we'll make sure that we cater to each of you today. And finally, uh, before I hand it over to Hillary, I would like to give you a little more information on our presenter. Hillary studied chemistry at Georgia Institute of Technology as an undergrad and after working as a chemistry teacher earned her PhD in instructional technology from the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. While at UVA, Hillary taught in the teacher training program and facilitated professional development in technology integration. Hillary's research interests have focused on contextual factors such as leadership and organizational conditions which enable effective implementation of professional development programs. As professional development and client services manager, Hillary worked with clients to choose professional development options and facilitate implementations of programs. Hillary's goal in this process is to understand clients' needs and provide effective professional development programs. Thank you very much for being with us today, Hillary, and if you're ready, let's get into our content for today. Great. Thanks, Keely, and thanks, everybody, for being online today. Um, so this webinar is talking about class data and then how to align data collection models with your feedback goals. So we'll review some characteristics of effective feedback and talk a little bit about the impact of that feedback on professional growth. Um, we'll learn about best practices for feedback, and then we'll think about some options for applying this information to your program. So we're going to start out um, first talking a little bit about the importance of interactions. Based on the poll questions, it looks like most of you are pretty familiar with the class. So this is something that you're probably familiar with as well. Interactions matter. Interactions are really at the core of what we do as educators. Um, particularly when we talk about the class tool, higher class scores, or another way of thinking about this, more highly effective interactions have a lot of impact on student achievement in different arenas. Um, so one of those arenas is behavioral engagement. So higher class scores, um, more effective interactions, they really increase children's engagement in the classroom. And this leads to outcomes um, both in terms of vocabulary and in terms of reading outcomes. As, as well as math achievement. So again, this is probably a concept that you're familiar with if you've been working with the class for quite some time. Since we're talking about feedback today, one of the things you might want to consider is whether the teachers that you're working with also are familiar with this. Um, you know, one of the things that we'll kind of unpack through this presentation is having teachers ready to receive feedback is really important and understanding why your organization is using the class tool, um, what's special about the class tool, why it's pertinent, that's a big part of teacher receptivity and, and readiness to accept this information. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so another thing to think about, you'll notice this bubble kind of at the bottom changed teacher, so it's, it's at higher class scores previously. So when we're talking about more effective interactions, um, we're really talking about the teacher leading those interactions with the children um, and, and really being the core of that. So, so that's why feedback is so important when we talk about giving feedback to teachers. So let's move into the data collection models. So there are two data collection models that we'll talk about today. We're going to talk about a classroom level data collection model and then a program level data collection model. So in the classroom level data collection, we're really talking about observing every single teacher in your sample. So whether your sample is just one center or whether it's a program or whether it's a grantee, if you want to deliver classroom level feedback, you need to think about observing every single classroom, right? So um, 
so this is really good if you want to make sure that you're looking at improvement at the teacher level, looking at growth of individual teachers over time. If you're thinking about very individualized professional development, such as coaching, this data collection model is really important that you're observing every single teacher and having specific feedback for that teacher. Okay, we'll contrast that classroom level data collection then with program level data collection. Okay, so program level data collection is different in that you're observing a subset of teachers. Okay, so you're not observing every single teacher in the center or in the program. You're observing a subset of teachers or, or a sample of teachers. Um, and so this is good if you're thinking about making program-wide professional development decisions. Um, so, so we want our entire program to engage in a certain type of coaching or a certain type of you know, formal professional development. Um, this program level data collection can work really well. Um, it can also help you kind of pinpoint um, if you want to dive deeper into data collection in, um, in a certain area. Okay, so when you're thinking about doing a program level data collection, um, you want to think about choosing a representative sample. So if you think about, you know, you're going to observe in, say, five centers, right? So you might have some centers that are in a more suburban area, some in a more urban area. You might have different size centers, some very large, some very small. So when you're choosing that subset of classrooms in which to observe, you want to think about um, you know, having that representative sample, having classrooms from both urban and suburban areas, classrooms from both large and small centers, so that you're really um, understanding what's going on a across the larger region that you're trying to kind of generalize to. All right. Um, so, so it's important to think about how these two models are different, right? So again, we looked at the classroom level data collection, and then we looked at the program level data collection. Um, so in the classroom level, we were observing in every single classroom, and we're going to give feedback to individual teachers based on that. In the program level, we're observing in that subset of classrooms, and we're going to use those data um, to make program-wide decisions. Um, what you want to consider is, and what you really don't want to do is attempt to provide individualized feedback to teachers based on program level data, right? So if you have, say, an average score based on a program level data collection model, it's not really going to make sense to then give feedback on that score to an individual teacher that may or may not be representative of that teacher's classroom, okay? So it's really important as you're thinking about the goals that you have, both for data collection and for feedback, to think about, you know, do I want to conference with individual teachers and talk to everybody, or do I really want to make a program level decision and pick the data collection model that corresponds? All right, and we'll kind of talk about using data from both of these. They, they both have their place. Neither is better than the other, um, but it's just using them correctly. They both, they both have a place in um, providing feedback within your, your center or your program. Okay, so we'll move now into talking about effective feedback and some characteristics of effective feedback. All right, and feedback sits right between observation and professional growth. This is kind of the way we think about it at TeachStone. Okay, so you have your observation. This is where, you know, you're going into the classroom, you're taking those detailed behavioral notes, you're assigning scores. Um, then the professional growth are your professional development options. Are you talking about coaching? Are you talking about um, a more coursework-based approach? Are you doing professional learning communities? And feedback sits right between the observation and the professional growth. It's kind of the gateway to professional growth is looking at, okay, what's really happening in this classroom? 
Okay, so so we're going to talk about that feedback piece a little more. Okay, um, so there are four characteristics of effective feedback um, that we talk about here at Teachstone: uh, descriptive, aligned, objective, and actionable. So I'll talk through those four now. So we talk about descriptive feedback. Um, Descriptive and specific. So I have uh, one coach that I work with, and she always says, paint me a picture. So you want to use enough detail that when you're talking to this teacher or this program director, whoever you're um, delivering the feedback to, um, you have enough specific behavioral detail, it's descriptive enough that this person can kind of visualize what happened in the classroom. Okay, so it's not vague. Um, it's, it's very pinpointed to exactly what the teacher did or said, how the children responded. Okay, and we'll look at some examples in just a minute um, to kind of uh, unpack that a little bit more. Uh, the second character is secure aligned. So when we say aligned, we mean aligned with class language, right? And so one of the benefits of using the class system is that everyone within your um, center or your program, wherever you're working, is going to have a common lens and a common language for talking about classrooms. So when you use that class language when you give feedback, it's going to clue that person in to exactly where they need to focus, right? Exactly what they did well, where they might need some work. So we're talking about using uh, dimension names, indicator names, behavioral marker names, and really aligning that descriptive behavioral feedback with the class language, okay? The third character is secure objective. Okay, so objective, um, you know, as the opposite of subjective, right? So, so you're not going to say to a teacher, um, you know, wow, you were really nice, you know? Um, you want to think about, okay, what objectively did I see that makes me think this teacher is nice? And, and this, you know, goes with using the class language, being descriptive. They all really work together. But, you know, you might think, wow, she really smiled at the children, and, and she laughed with them, and she talked about how their weekend went. You know, that's why I thought she was nice. So that's more objective. I saw you smile. I saw you laugh. I heard you ask Jenny how her birthday party went, right? Um, and then the last characteristic here, actionable. So in the end, you know, at the end of providing this feedback, you, you want the feedback receiver to be able to walk away and do something with the feedback, right? It needs to be actionable. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as well when we look at the examples. All right. So, so those are those four um, characteristics I just described. Kind of say, you know, what is the feedback that I'm providing? You know, when I sit down, you know, next to this person at the table, what am I going to say? Um, the next two um, speak a little more to the context in which you're providing the feedback. So, this feedback supportive, and it builds on strengths. Right. Um, so as a feedback provider, you may be in a coaching role. I noticed from the poll many of you all are coaches. Um, you may not be in a coaching role. You could be in a supervisory role. Um, you know, a number of different relationships you might have with the person that you're speaking to. But when you're providing feedback, it's always in a, a supportive nature, right? Which doesn't mean that you can't give um, feedback that is um, – you know, critical or actionable or, you know, focuses on a growth area, you can definitely do that and we encourage you to do that, but it's in a, in a supportive context. Um, we also talk here at Teachstone a lot about building on strengths, right? So, so you're not only talking about, you know, here's what didn't go well, here's what you need to do better. You're also focusing on Here's what you did really well. Can you do more of that? Or you did this really well in centers. Maybe you can um, do use some of those same strategies when you're in circle time. So you're really building on um, what's working in the classroom. All right. So let's look at um, a few examples. So we'll look at a couple examples of feedback around um, strengths 
in the classroom. And then in the next slide, we'll look at a couple examples um, of some areas for growth in the classroom. All right? Uh, and, and I'll just read these out. You demonstrated positive communication when you congratulated Sarah, saying, great job building a very tall tower. Sarah smiled after your comment. Okay, so let's kind of look through this one for a minute. Um, so very descriptive and specific, right? So if, when you're thinking about descriptive and specific, you're thinking about what did the teacher do? What did the teacher say? How did the children respond, right? So we have here the teacher said, we have a quote, great job building a very tall tower. She smiled, right? So she, she responded favorably. Um, so, so that's that descriptive piece, right? Um, so the next characteristic we talked about aligned, aligned with class language. Um, so those of you who may be uh, more familiar with the class or maybe you have your manual or your dimensions guide out, positive communication, all right, is um, in that positive climate dimension. All right, so, so now this teacher knows all right, I can go look at positive climate. I can think more about positive communication and how I can use these strategies at other times during the day. Okay. Um, and then it's objective, right? So we've really focused on um, observations, not inferences. Okay. Um, so, so I'm not saying, um, wow, you were really sensitive. To, um, to Sarah's needs, or um, Sarah seems to really like you. You know, we're being really specific. We, we heard the teacher say this, and we saw Sarah smile. So it's those observations, things we can pick up with our senses. We can see them. We can hear them. That's what we're really looking for in terms of objective. Um, so, so the goal usually, you know, we talked about having this feedback be actionable. That's going to come through the conversation with the teacher, right? So, so now after you've delivered this feedback, right, you've said this is what I saw, this is what I heard in your classroom, um, you maybe want to pose a question, right? And so that question um, hopefully will lead into an actionable goal, but it's really the, the question you ask is dependent on your relationship with the teacher, the teacher's goals, your style, um, the teacher's characteristics. So there's not, there's not just one way to do this, you know, but, but an example might be, um, you know, yeah, this happened during uh, center time. I noticed there wasn't very much positive communication during circle time. You know, is there a way you can build in this, you know, these great examples of positive communication at other times during the day? You know, so, so thinking about that, all right? Um, so I'll quickly go through the next example, and then we'll move to maybe the um, growth areas. So the second example here, you used parallel talk as children colored pictures of farm animals. You said, you are coloring the horse's mane with a brown crayon. Okay, so again, very specific and descriptive. We've got this quote here. We know exactly what the teacher said. Um, aligned with class language, parallel talk being part of that language modeling dimension. Um, Subjective, right? So um, it's uh, it's an observation that we heard what the teacher said, not an inference. Um, you know, and again, you might uh, think about what question you can ask to get that teacher making um, kind of an actionable goal from this. All right. So we will move on to look at um, a growth area. Okay, so these are two examples of feedback you might give um, on some areas where you think this teacher needs, uh, maybe needs to focus a little bit, areas of focus. All right, so three children sitting at the art table ran out of materials, and it took about five minutes before you were aware and responsive to the situation. During this time, the children were not engaged in the activity, right? So again, descriptive and specific, Right? So, um, so we saw the three children sitting at the art table. We saw that they didn't have the materials they needed. We have a specific time here. It took five minutes. So, um, so kind of skipping forward to that objective, I'm not saying it took a long time, you know, in Hillary's perspective, in my perspective, we're saying it took five minutes, right? Um, so, and then we're saying, how did the children respond? 
During this time, the children weren't engaged in the activity. So descriptive and specific. Then we've got aligned. So for those um, you know, really familiar with the class tool, that aware and responsive are indicators within teacher sensitivity. Right? So it took five minutes before you were aware the children needed materials and then responded to that. Again, objective, we're saying, you know, it took five minutes, not a long time or too long, but, but five minutes, it's objective. Um, so then moving to the actionable again, after you've delivered this feedback, um, you know, you probably want to involve the teacher in thinking through um, how can I use this feedback in the classroom? You know, and again, you're thinking about the teacher's kind of personality characteristics, um, her goals for the classroom. There might be some program level goals for the classroom that you're considering. So all of that is going to influence how this conference, how this conversation moves forward, right? Um, but, you know, one thing you might think about is, um, you know, how might you prevent this from happening in the future, right? And so the, the teacher could go a number of different ways with this. She might say, um, I can be more prepared in the future. I can prepare better for the lesson, which really would um, work into that productivity dimension, right? Um, she might say, well, I can really set expectations with the children around what to do when they need something in the classroom and, and how the children can get my attention, which might work into behavior management, right? And it might work a little bit into regard in terms of autonomy. Maybe there's a place where the children can be responsible for gathering their own materials. Um, so the teacher could have a number of different ways in which she might prevent this from happening in the future. And, and your job as that feedback provider is to kind of put that into class language and, and help the teacher make a plan around how to prevent this type of situation in the future. So we'll look quickly at the second example. Um, during story time, you asked few open-ended questions, but rather focused on closed questions, such as what color is the bird? Children had little opportunity to use language during this session, right? So again, descriptive, okay? Um, we've got the quote here, what color is the bird? Um, children had little opportunity to use language. That's how children responded. Um, we've got the class language of open-ended questions, part, of, again, of language modeling. Um, it's, it's objective. Right? We could maybe even make this more objective if we're saying, you know, you asked few open-ended questions and more closed questions. Sometimes people will quantify that a little bit. So we could maybe even make it more objective, right? And then, um, and then again, you're thinking about, okay, how can I guide the teacher through questioning to make a goal around this? Um, and, and so you might ask, you know, how could you ask more open-ended questions in the future and, and kind of help that teacher um, put her ideas in class language and, and make a plan around that, all right? So those are some examples of, of feedback. All right, so, so now that we've talked about um, characteristics of effective feedback, let's talk a little about how you're going to use feedback um, you know, in your program or in your center. So we'll talk about using classroom level feedback. We'll also talk about using program level feedback. All right, so there are four steps here, okay? Um, so this is using classroom level feedback. So, so remember, think back to the two data collection models. We had classroom level so classroom level data collection, we're collecting feedback, or we're collecting data, I'm sorry, in every single classroom. So we're going to provide feedback to the teacher individually. Okay, so this feedback is based on what I saw this specific teacher doing. All right? Um, so we're going to talk about each of these um, four topics individually, okay, on subsequent slides. All right, so number one, you're going to provide that teacher with information. And, and what we mean is information about, about the class tool, about the class observation. Um, ideally, really this happens um, before 
the observation. So ideally, before you go in to observe or before someone else goes in to observe, someone has had a conversation with this teacher to say, you know, here's why we're using the class tool. Here's what's important about it. Um, when we come into your classroom, here's what we're going to be looking for, you know, talking about the different dimensions to say, this is what I'll be focused on. Um, you know, hopefully talk a little bit about how class observations work. I'm going to do, you know, be in your classroom for about two hours. I'm going to observe for 20 minutes, taking notes. I'll assign some scores. You know, um, letting the teacher know what's going to happen. Um, so that's ideal is that teachers get that information prior to the observation so that when someone comes into their classroom with a clipboard, they, they know what's going on, right? Um, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes teachers don't get that information um, prior to the observation. So you can ask, you know, um, did you have any questions about the class observation process? How was, how was the class observation for you? Um, you know, did you get this information? Um, and make sure that these things are covered prior to giving feedback to really give that feedback some context. All right, so you've provided information, right? Um, you're going to plan ahead before your conference. Okay, so, so that's pretty obvious with, you know, a lot of you are coaches. Um, so you're going to plan ahead, right? So you're going to look over your score report. You're going to look over the comments. Um, and some, um, in some organizations, you may be the observer and the feedback provider. So maybe you assign the scores and you wrote the comments. Um, some organizations separate these roles so that you may be getting scores and observer comments from someone else that you need to look over and understand, right? Um, but you're going to read over all of this. Um, schedule a meeting with the teacher, and you'll, you'll plan your comments, right? Um, so you'll think about, you know, what, what was this teacher's strengths? What was this teacher's growth area? Um, and then the other thing you're really going to plan is um, not just how can I deliver this information, um, but what are some questions that I can ask of this teacher that are going to help her or him really be engaged in the plan? Um, have this teacher think about, um, you know, what, what can I do better and, and what are some reasonable goals for my classroom and um, how are my actions affecting the children in my classroom? So, so you're planning comments, but you're also planning questions. Um, and not that you're going to ask those questions in kind of a rote way, but you've got them in your back pocket so that you can really have a conversation with this teacher um, in the feedback session. All right, then you'll bring what you need. So you may uh, bring your dimensions guide. Um, the teacher may or may not have a copy of the dimensions guide. You may suggest that she bring hers if she has one. Um, your class manual, you may need that um, specifically if, the, if um, the teacher you're working with asks for some examples or some more nuanced information about you know, what it means to be high versus mid, you know, things like that. Um, you may need your class manual. Video clips, so if you um, have done a video observation of the teacher and you want, um, you want her or him to actually watch pieces of their own practice, you may bring those video clips. Um, and then probably bring a copy of the score report and your um, specific comments, you know, that your feedback that's, you know, descriptive, aligned. You, you'll probably write some of that out beforehand and bring it with you so you're ready. All right, and then in the conference, you're going to cover the key topics, right? So we talked about key topics being importance of effective interactions and structure of class framework. Those you may skip if the teacher already is really familiar with that, but you want to check in and, and make sure that the teacher has some context right, for understanding this feedback. Um, you're going to cover the observation report. So you may provide scores. You may not. Um, you might make a choice to provide ranges rather than scores. So you might, um, you know, 
give information about low, mid, or high versus, you know, this was a three or this was a six. Um, you may not choose either. You may not share either of those. So it really depends on um, the level of familiarity that your organization has with the class tool. So we always talk about not providing a score if that score isn't really going to mean much to the person receiving the score. So some people you might say, you know, this score was a four and, and that doesn't mean a whole lot, right? So that's not going to be really valuable information. But if you're in a program that has been using the class tool for a number of years, you know, that that four may make a ton of sense and may be really useful information. Um, but it may be, you know, better to just say mid-level. Um, maybe better to say neither of those. Um, so that's something you're going to want to think about ahead of time. The areas of strength and areas of growth you'll talk about with the teacher, um, you know, and, and talk about what that teacher thinks are her own areas of strength and growth and, and kind of work from that. Uh, but you'll, you'll want to have some thoughts of your own, obviously, kind of in your back pocket um, to guide the conversation. All right. And then improvement plans. So you always want to get to, okay, now that you have this information, what are you going to do with it moving forward? So the things that were strong, how are you going to um, enact in those ways more frequently or use them in times during the day, maybe during meal times or outdoor time when um, that maybe were less effective? Okay, so how can you use those strengths more? Um, or in the growth areas, um, what are some goals for, for building on those growth areas? Okay, so if it's, I didn't hear a lot of open-ended questions, how can you ensure that you're asking more open-ended questions moving forward? All right. Um, so again, we're still talking about classroom-level feedback. We'll get to program-level feedback in just a minute. Um, so when should we provide feedback, right? So um, when doing so is part of data collection goals and plans. And this really um, combines with that third bullet point when classrooms were observed individually. So again, you know, we talked about the two data collection models, classroom and program level. And you're thinking about, okay, my goal was to give classroom level feedback. My goal was to work with individual teachers. So I collected data in individual classrooms. And, and now I'm providing that individualized feedback. Okay, so it's all, you know, aligned within that plan. Um, also, and we talked about this previously too, when teachers have prior knowledge of the class measure. So you want to make sure that before you give feedback, teachers know what the tool is, why you're using it, um, what's important about it, what they can expect for their children, you know, in their classroom as a result of using this tool, really provide that context. Um, and then who should provide feedback. So in order to provide feedback, you want to have some relationship with this teacher, right? You're going to um, build a relationship, you know, based on trust and, you know, receptivity to feedback and, and all of those things. And then before providing feedback, you want to make sure that you yourself have an in-depth knowledge of the mm -hmm. class tool. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're able to explain, you know, what the difference is between, um, you know, high and mid. You want to be able to ensure that you can give relevant examples to the teacher when she asks. You want to make sure that you're able to construct those guiding questions. All right, so that was the classroom level feedback. Now we'll move into talking a little bit about program level feedback. So again, this is, you can see the, the graphic on your page here um, where there's um, a number of little boxes and, and some of those are highlighted and some aren't. So that's to signal you that in this program level data collection model, you're collecting data only in a subset of classrooms. So you haven't observed in every classroom. You've observed in that representative sample of classrooms. Um, and so you, you're going to need to use those data differently, okay? And um, so this says engage teaching staff as a community. So you're not giving individualized feedback to teachers 
when you're using this program level model. You're, you're looking at aggregated data. You're looking at those averages and you're making some program level decisions. Okay, so you're engaging your teaching staff as a community. And we'll talk through establishing common goals, providing professional development, and then organizing for implementation in the subsequent slides here. So establishing common goals is, is pretty similar to what we talked about in terms of the classroom level feedback, right? So ideally, prior to the observation, um, you want everybody to understand um, why effective interactions are important, right? They lead to these social and emotional gains for children, achievement games, gains in mm -hmm. vocabulary, math, reading, you know, all of these things. You want everyone to understand what's the structure of the class framework. So, you know, when you're using that aligned language, when you're saying, you know, um, parallel talk or open-ended questions or, um, you know, teacher sensitivity. Everyone's on the same page with what those words mean, right? Um, everyone knows why we're doing the class observations and how they work. So when someone comes into my classroom, here's what they're looking for, here's what they're doing, right? So ideally that happens before the observation. Um, when you move to giving that program level feedback, um, oftentimes you're going to be in a group of teachers, right? So it may be um, you, you have a staff meeting with all the teachers in your center, or it may be that you have a professional learning community and you're working with a small group of teachers. But a lot of times you're going to be with a group here, right? Um, some people may have been observed and some people may not have because this is, again, a subset of classrooms have been observed. But you want to kind of debrief, right? So, so how was the observation experience? What happened? Give everybody kind of a, a chance to voice their experience, right? Um, and then move into here's what we saw, right? The class observation report. So whether, again, that's sharing scores, or ranges, low, mid, high. Maybe you're sharing neither of those, but you're sharing that um, descriptive and specific feedback. You know, um, we saw, uh, you know, behavior management in these ways and, and really describing what the teacher did and said and how the children responded. Um, you're going to share that with the group um, and work through what are some areas of strength for our program, what are some areas of growth for our program, um, and what's our plan to improve, what are some options that you might have. Um, what's important here is to remember that this is program level feedback, it's based on an average of classrooms, right? It's aggregated data. So it's important not to imply that, you know, um, this score or this range or this description is necessarily descriptive of um, every teacher's classroom, right? Because you've got a whole range in there. Um, some may be more effective, some less effective. So it's, it's really important to make sure you're saying, this is just our program overall. This is an average. It may or may not describe every single classroom in our program, but we're all in this together, and, and we're going to all work on some common areas, okay? And even if you're strong in a specific area, as educators, we're always trying to get better. So this is applicable to everybody. Um, but again, may not represent your, what's actually happening in your classroom, right? It's an average. So once you've established those common goals, you're going to provide for professional development, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to say we need to grow in these areas and, and not provide ways to grow, okay? So you're going to think about um, what are some options for my staff to develop, right? Um, and so within that, you're going to consider the characteristics of the staff. So do people like learning individually or together as a group? Um, does your teaching staff have time after school where they could stay and um, do some kind of coursework together? Or do they really need to go home and maybe online might be better? Um, you know, do you have a group who maybe likes something more informal like coaching 
or, or somebody who likes to sit down with a facilitator and have someone lead them through like a PowerPoint presentation type professional development. So kind of thinking through what's my staff um, like and then plan for some differentiated options because, um, you know, online might not work for everybody. Coaching might not work for everybody. Um, so ideally you have a couple different options that are going to work for different people in your staff and you can really match people up with something that's going to be individualized um, for them. Not that everybody has a different PD plan, but maybe you have two options and you know people are able to align with one that really suits their needs. Okay, and then thinking about providing ongoing support. So it's not, um, you know, a one-day workshop and and that's it. And now we expect, you know, huge gains from you. But really, how can we support people in an ongoing way? Then lastly, you'll organize for implementation. So, um, so this is where you're really thinking about how do I make this plan work? Okay, so building collaborative processes, strengthening school culture. Um, if I'm going to do video-based coaching, do I have the camera and the, uh, um, you know, computers and technology that I need? Um, if I really want to think about professional learning community, is there a space where teachers can sit together and work together? Um, do I have the dimensions guides that people need or access to the video library that they can use to improve? So, so do, do I have the time and space and organizational conditions in place to really make this plan work for the teachers that, that I'm working with? All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about the class system. So that was how to use class data um, at a program level. Um, and so we'll kind of talk through how we at TeachStones think about these different resources that you can use um, as, as part of this plan. So we've got learn, measure, and improve. And I'll talk about each of these. So the learn piece, we've talked about the learn piece a lot. Um, we didn't call it that. But this learn piece is where you're really thinking about um, helping your audience understand um, why the class tool is important, why interactions are important, um, why your organization is using class, what the expectations are, um, what does the class tool measure. Um, that's really this learn piece. So it's really setting the stage for the observation, feedback, and professional growth. Um, sometimes we think about it as building investment or building buy-in, um, but it's really setting that context um, for, for the next steps here. And we have a couple of resources that help with this. Um, we have the Dimensions Guide, uh, which is a um, booklet that uh, really shows the different indicators and behavioral markers within each dimension and, and some strategies for growth in each dimension. Um, so this is a really great resource for teachers to have. We also have an introduction to the class tool, which is both online and face-to-face. -face. Um, so those are some things to think about, really providing that foundation, providing the context um, for teachers to understand what's happening next, what's going to come next, all right? And then what does come next is measure. So if you think back to a graphic earlier, we talked about feedback really um, sitting right between the observation and professional growth, right? Um, so feed, it's feedback on an observation, um, and it's that gateway to professional growth. So measure is really the observation itself. So we provide resources for this, the, um, you know, the probably the most prominent one, the class observation training, where you're actually learning how to use the class tool um, reliably, testing, becoming a reliable observer. Then we also have a train the trainer program. So um, that's used to build capacity within your organization. So TeachStone can deliver the observation training or someone within your organization could undergo the train the trainer program and provide that observation training. Two other resources that are really important to think about um, are double coding and calibration. So your feedback is really only as good as the observation data you're collecting, right? So, um, so within your feedback, you're being 
uh, very descriptive and specific. You're using that class language. You're being objective. And double coding and calibration really help with that and scoring accurately, okay, so that you can really get that accurate feedback to the teachers in your program. Um, then lastly in the system, we have improve. So improve is your professional development. So, so with learn, I've really set the stage, set the context for my teachers to be receptive to this feedback, ready to receive the feedback. Um, with measure and um, the calibration resources, I've collected accurate scores. You know, I have a very valid, reliable observation. Um, and now I want my teachers to improve. So I want some professional development for my teachers. So there are a number of different resources that we have here, um, going from the video library being kind of the least intensive, all the way up to um, our coaching program, my, my teaching partner. Um, and so when looking at these resources, um, you're really thinking, you know, again, like we talked about earlier when we talked about choosing uh, professional development options. Um, what are the characteristics of my program and my staff? How much money do we have? How much time do we have? How do my teachers like to learn? Um, you know, do they need to learn at home? Do they need to learn in a group? Do they need to learn individually? Um, and those types of questions can really guide you in choosing the professional development options that are best suited to your organization. Um, so that brings us to the end of our planned content today, and I want to, um, in the last 10 minutes or so, go ahead and open up for questions. Yep. Thank you very much, Hillary. I know we have a lot of questions, so we want to get started on those right away, but remember you can continue to submit your questions while we're answering them using the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can, but any that we aren't able to answer live, we will follow up with you after the webinar today. So also a quick reminder to take our event survey, and it should take you less than a minute to answer the five quick questions. You can access the survey by clicking on the red survey button on the far right of the console, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We appreciate your taking the time for this because it will help us to improve the quality of our webinars in the future. And finally, if you have any questions after the webinar, don't hesitate to contact us. You can see uh, several channels by which we can be contacted up on your screen right now. And without further ado, um, our first question for Hillary is from Rosalie, and Rosalie would like to know how soon should feedback be provided following a class observation? Is there a recommended time frame? That's a really good question. Um, I would say really as soon as possible, you know, so um, we don't have really an evidence-based recommended time frame. Um, but, you know, I typically say within a week, you know, is a good goal. Um, but as soon as possible. So if you think about everything that happens in a day or a week, um, you know, so many different thoughts intrude after the observation, both for you and for the teacher who you're observing, um, which make it difficult to be really specific and descriptive, right? Um, and so if you're able to give that feedback um, very soon after, that observation is much more fresh in your head, and, um, and so it's easier to really use that information. Um, so I, I hope that's a good answer. I, I would just say as soon as possible. The more immediate, the better. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Um, our next question is from Gail, and she would like to know what is double coding and what is calibration? Okay, great question. So double coding and calibration, um, really have a similar purpose, which is um, supporting an observer and maintaining reliability and scoring, okay? So, you know, as many of you know, once you become a, a certified observer with the class, you recertify once a year. But within that year, there might be drift and, um, you know, you might not be as reliable, right? Um, so double coding is live. Someone from TeachStone comes to your organization to code side by side with an observer, and then they conference after that observation to look at um, scores. You know, was the observer um, 
reliable with the Teach Zone expert coders scores and then talk through where they might have gone wrong. Um, so that's a live procedure. Calibration is done remotely and um, in groups. It's not one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we have calibration videos. So um, multiple people within an organization would code the same video and then follow up with a webinar that really talks about, um, you know, tricky points for scoring within that video and and that kind of thing. So it's really about maintaining, both of those are about maintaining reliability. All right, and uh, let's answer one more question before we close out for today. Um, Pat would like to know where can we get the intro to the class book? Um, so I, I think you mean the dimensions guide. We've got the dimensions guide and the manual. So the dimensions guide um, is really that introduction that uh, it's helpful if all teachers have. And that's in our online store. So if you visit teachstone.com and, and click the link for store, you can buy the dimensions guide there. All right. That's great. Thank you so much, Hillary. And I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today as well. Uh, that's about it for our time, so we'll be sure to follow up with any of your other questions that didn't get answered live on the webinar today, and we will also be posting the entire webinar on our site, and we'll email you instructions for the on-demand viewing in case you happen to have any audio issues or didn't catch the very beginning or very end of the webinar today. We'll have the full thing available for you um, sometime this week, and then we hope that you've learned a lot about providing effective feedback using class data and that you'll be in touch with us with any further questions or if you'd like more feedback from us. And we look forward to seeing you at our webinars, which will